the painting behind me is called Girl from Tanagra by Gustav Klimt, who's a favourite artist of mine. Um, I'm not going to review that painting right now, although I'm, I may get round to Klimt. I thought I'd put it up to set a suitably ponty, let's all be arty mood. Um, let's get rid of all that. And let's go back here. This is a painting showing statesmen from World War One. If you go to the National Portrait Gallery, it sits at the end of one gallery and it dominates the wing. Um, it does look quite dark in reality as well. The painter was going for quite a dark tone. The painter is this gentleman, Sir James Guthrie, who is now probably not well known except to devotees of artwork and people who enjoy sort of reading about it it's a in the wing that's devoted to sort of paintings extolling the empire basically i'm going to show you the painting itself i'm not going to do a talk about sir james guttery's life in just i'm just going to use this wikipedia article for the small section that mentions the painting in 1919 guthrie was commissioned by south african financier Abr Sir abraham bailey first baronet to paint a group portrait of 17 politicians and statements of britain and its allies who were held office during the first world war the painting statesman of world war one was completed in 1930 shortly before guthrie's death the painting was donated to the national portrait gallery Guthrie's 17 proprietary oil studies were donated to Scottish National Portrait Gallery. Um, in 1920, the King of Belgium conferred Guthrie with the cross of commander of the Order of the Crown. The rest of it is generally basically bits about his work and that. But this one painting is probably the most famous thing he ever did. When you approach it, on the middle floor of the National Portrait Gallery, it immediately dominates the the area. It's meant to be a sort of showpiece painting. It's still it's quite subdued lighting up there on the second floor. Um, what amuses me is although that it shows figures that were hugely famous in their day, with the exception probably of. Um, Winston Churchill's head glowers out there out of the middle. Many of the others will be largely forgotten unless you're reasonably well-schooled in history. The individuals depicted are from left to right, starting with those seated on the left of the side of the table, Sir Joseph Cook, former Prime Minister of Australia, Billy Hughes, Prime Minister of Australia. I don't think anyone but people who are really well-schooled in history are going to be familiar with these figures. The next person, of course... People who are even have a moderate knowledge of history will be aware of David Lloyd George, of course. Alfred Miller, you may have heard of, and William Massey. Winston Churchill, of course, inevitably will have heard of. It would be very difficult not to hear of him. But what interested me more is you've got standing behind Lord George, Ganga Sin, Maharaja Bikaner, the only non-white member of the Imperial War Cabinet, and you've got Louis Botha, Prime Minister of the Union of South Africa. Now, Botha had, of course, famously also fought against Britain as well. Behind Churchill are George Barnes, leader of the National Democratic and Labour Party, Sir Robert Borden, Prime Minister of Canada, to their right, Sir Arthur Bellflower. And there's a figure we may you may have heard of and who has other particular roles in British history, some of which are still having an effect on us right now. H.H. H. Asquith, first Earl of Oxford, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 1908 to 1916, and Sir Eric Geddes, first Lord of the Admiralty, and Bona Law, and Edward Morris and Herbert Kitchener. Kitchener, by the way, as the article notes down the bottom, is standing away from everyone because he died in the sinking of H.M. As Hampshire in 1916, so his portrait is posthumous. Let me enlarge it. As you can see, you have a sort of an angel that's been more or less decapitated, symbolizing, I presume, mourning. A particular, the Maharaj, I find particularly interesting that he's standing off to the left behind the table. 
he's almost part of the group, but not part of the group. It's almost he's in there on sufferance. Um, you get a feeling of that with both as well, who seems to have been rendered as well. He was almost, um, well, almost a Chinese effect to the face there, rather than both as face, which I'm quite familiar from other pictures. Lie George is instantly noticeable sitting off there in with his Welsh wizard face. At, and Winston Churchill sitting there looking quizzically in the middle, the man of the hour. It's quite interesting that, as when by the time this had finished, Winston Churchill was by no means such a major political figure as when it was started. So the fact that he's ended up at the middle is is quite interesting. I found it a fascinating picture as a kind of image of vanished empire that was only when it was finished in 1930, 10 years from World War II and 15 years from really the end of empire, where the empire was slowly dissolving and the India that the Maharaja belonged to would be gone within 20 years after this painting was finished and be an independent state. Lloyd George sitting there would end up, of course, along with Winston Churchill, being intimately involved in the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Some of these other figures around that table would also have some involvement in that. Some of the others, as I say, are largely forgotten unless you are a, stud a student of, of the history of the period. They have lapsed into the, shall we say, the condition of being footnotes of history showing how all too easy that can happen. It's plainly meant to suggest power and authority, but it's also meant to suggest loss. And that whole gallery was well worth a visit. Although what I found very interesting was that um, although it does have a whole section on decolonization and there's loads of these pictures, with various ways to interpret them noted um, next to them. The whole Irish home rule crisis has been reduced to a box about, oh, so big in the middle of the <laughs> of, of the gallery with a picture of Eamon de Valera and a couple of other pictures, and that's it. That's your lot, uh, which I found quite funny, perhaps because that's an ongoing situation and it's touchy. Nobody really wanted to deal with that one too much. But if anyone is in London or fancies a trip around a gallery, it's well worth a, a trip around there. Even if you don't particularly share the sentiments the painting is trying to convey, you can still appreciate it just for the brush strokes and and the and and the quality of work that's gone into it. You don't have to share the the sentiments of empire to appreciate the quality of a product.